Welcome to the Clareye Community Church Apostolic Centre. There's such a presence of God here this morning, if you're in this place already. I can feel that touching me. And what we desire more than anything, and we invite you to come into the presence of a great and mighty God. That's what we desire more than anything. So you are welcome in this place today, through whichever medium you come from wherever you are come and be in his presence today the greatest place we can ever be you are so welcome holy spirit come touch us here touch them out there but lord let's have your presence here today
Holy 
Good morning, everybody. I might have a slightly cro a croaky voice. I can hear it. Sorry, you're going to have to put up with it. Um, so Goitsch asked me if I would uh, um, bring the word today. Uh, and in fact, I, caught, I almost preempted it because I felt God was saying something to me. Um, and in the style of me, as you've become accustomed, I've got a big piece, lots of paper. Um, there's lots of little bits, and I'm hoping that somehow or other it'll all thread together, hopefully. I have to say that I, I, the, the bit that I wanted to speak about is nearer the end. Um, not that I don't want to speak about the stuff in the beginning as well. <laughs> but hopefully it all ties in, hopefully. Um, I have got, for those of you who are not used to me, I've got a bit of a flitting mind. I tend to see something. I think, oh, that's interesting. And then I go off in a direction down here and there and there. And as I call it, I go down lots of rabbit holes. Um, so anyway, we're going to start off with um, looking at Psalm 42. Um, I'll read it out to you. Um, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Where can I go and stand before him? Day and night I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking. As I remember how it used to be, I walked among the crowds of worshippers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a celebration. Why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my saviour and my God. Now I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the, Jin, the Jordan, from the land of Mount Mizar. I hear the tumult of raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. O oh God, my rock, I cry, why have you forgotten me? Why, am, why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones, they scoff, where is this God of yours? Why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God, I will praise him again, my saviour and my God. I can remember saying something to someone once. I can remember the very instance, the room I was standing in, um, and I used the phrase, sometimes you've got to fake it to make it. Um, it and not in all situations, but you know those times when you're standing outside um, a place that you're about to go into, you don't really know anybody there, you're dreading going in. And uh, I, I, it happens to me all the time. I, I, I think, oh, I really don't want to go. Anyway, you pin a smile on your face and you go on in, don't you? Because you want people to think that you're comfortable and, and you're happy and that you're approachable because you want to get to know people, so you want to be approachable. If you're sitting there looking miserable, like <laughs> no one's going to want to come up and meet you or introduce themselves to you. So sometimes you do have to kind of pin a smile on and fake it to make it, even though you fancy disappearing into the background. Um, and sometimes, I understand there are occasions where it's not the case, but sometimes when you're feeling fed up, the shift in the mood can only happen when you decide not to be fed up, to change your mindset or your frame of mind. And looking at that psalm, I have a feeling that's what the psalmist was talking about when they wrote Psalm 42. They had a heaviness hanging over them. He says his heart is breaking and says, why am I so discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And it's like they're shaking their heads, kind of trying to rid themselves of these thoughts, the way you, you read it, well, the way I've read it anyway, and that they're quite annoyed that they're stuck in this rut. And, they're, and then they make a decision. You can see but, um, in, part they, in parts they say, and then I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. It says, now I'm deeply discouraged, but I will remember you. And, you know, it's a real struggle when you're feeling really low and like everything is against you. And we all have had times and perhaps are in times at the moment where it's difficult. And then you've got to remind yourself there's something that you can do about it. And you can choose not to feel that way and that you're going to focus on something else. And you know, a lot of times in scripture it says that God is the one who gives us the thing that we might feel 
that we have to try and work ourselves. You know, we have to kind of summon it up within ourselves. But actually, God is able in all situations to give you the very thing that you need. You know, when it says, um, this says in scripture about faith, when we lack for faith for something, we can ask for more faith. Um, we know that God is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And that, he, that means, you know, as he, is able, as he gives us our level of faith, he can also give us more. It tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, in accordance with the faith God has di- distributed to each of you. So your faith is God-given. And as he is the one that gives it to us, we can ask him for more. It says when we lack wisdom, we can ask God for more wisdom. It tells us in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. That's quite nice, isn't it, that it says without finding fault. He's not saying, oh, hang on a minute, you did this, this, and yesterday you did this, why should I? He never, he never looks at any of that stuff, all the circumstances that he could, but he doesn't. And he'll give it to us anyway, because he's a generous God. And in Psalm 32, it says that he will guide us along the best pathway for our life and advise us. So he's there every step of the way, every little gap where we think, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I, we can ask God for it. It's amazing, isn't it? And sometimes we need to practice enthusiasm. That faking it until we make it, <clears throat> it's not about not being real, but it is about making a decision not to stay in that place of negativity and lifting yourself out of it. And we know this works. Um, it might seem very earthly. It's kind of a, a bit of a thing that the earth kind of uses isn't it in saying oh um you know positivity and all that and you can get that kind of oh i'd not like not like that way of thinking but actually that's god given that that positivity um so when we start thinking about the positive things in our lives and for me and for you obviously as well it's the god good things that god has given us And if actually I can think of one good thing that God has given me, I can suddenly think of another and another and another. And then my thoughts are focusing on him, not on all the things that are going wrong. And I read that when it comes to enthusiasm, we should think enthusiastically, believe enthusiastically, pray enthusiastically, talk enthusiastically until enthusiasm becomes part of the natural. And this idea... It's not unlike, I've got a little uh, story here of me saying all the time, when somebody asks me how I'm feeling, I say, yeah, not bad. And it does, it comes off the back of my, that I don't even think about it. Anyway, I was talking to Goitsch about the fact that I was in a very strange mood. I think I must have been very tired. I was driving home from work, I'd had a, a long day, and I was thinking, um, what if I put so in front of all the things that I said so that I was less kind of wishy-washy so that if anyone asks me what my week had been like instead of saying not bad, I'd say so good. Or I could equally say so bad. And I have said that a couple of times this week. I've had such such a bad week. (laughs) Um, But you know what? I think even if your, um, your... being negative enthusiastically is probably better than being lukewarm and in the middle saying, not bad. And I know that if I'm really at my wit's end, I'm at least more likely to say, I can't do this anymore. And then I'm going to turn to the one who can solve the situation for me. It's just like that psalmist says about deciding not to focus on what is going on. and Instead, I'm going to praise God. And when I was looking for a particular scripture um, on my rabbit hole journey, I did find an article which I thought was really interesting. Thank you. Um, which was about the word enthusiasm. Thank you, Vicky. You're welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> that was said in really enthusiastically. Thank you, Vicky. That, was, that water is so good. I found out something interesting about the word enthusiasm. You know me, I love my words. I love to know what they're about. Does anyone know where enthusiasm comes from? Any guesses? Right. It's a Greek word, which is about God. Mm. So the word theos means God 
And the word enthusiastic means full of God. Isn't that amazing? So have a think about that. Every time you're a bit scathing towards somebody who's a little bit enthusiastic, like, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> then have a think about it. In, in sometimes previously, it, it literally does mean full of God. And sometimes previously, it's been used in a derogatory fashion, meaning that somebody's slightly manic. But to be fair, if that mania is about God, it literally means we're inspired by or having a passion for God. I'll take that. I think that's, that's me. I can do that and seek after enthusiasm in my life. If that's what it is, that's, that's what I want. Anyway, that verse that I was looking to find is um, taken from Haggai um, chapter 1, and it's when God speaks to his people through the prophet Haggai about the building of the second temple in Jerusalem, and he makes the people face the reality of their choices, that they spent their efforts building their own houses and their own lives, and in doing so have completely neglected God and his house. And when this is pointed out to them, They change what they're doing and begin to obey God. And as they do this, it says in the New King James Version that God stirred the spirit of the people. And in, yeah, I've got the, um, I've got a slightly different version. in, In the New King James, it says stirred the spirit. The very same word as enthusiasm in other versions. He was giving them the passion for that job that they said, yeah, we're going to do it. So he was giving them the passion. And I just wanted to show you, you can ask God for enthusiasm. If you're feeling low on enthusiasm for something, you can ask God for it. So in verse 12, it said, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people, began to obey the message from the Lord their God. When they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of the God, the house of their God, the Lord of Heaven's army. You know, like I said at the beginning. When you feel less than enthusiastic about the job that's ahead, God can give you that just in the same way as you ask God for wisdom and for faith and for discernment and for direction and for advice. You can ask him to make you enthusiastic about something as well. Um, This is where it might start to jump around a bit. I wanted to start off with that bit. So the second part of the things I wanted to talk about is where all of this began, and it actually began on the the last few verses. Um, And one of the verses jumped out and made me want to read a bit more. And it comes from that same scripture, Psalm 42. But it's the last part which says, um, now this is, I I think the first one I read was in NIV. This is now in New King James. Um, I'm not quite sure why I had this version on, but I I do like to look between versions when I'm reading. It's that very last part of the the psalm that says, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And that word, countenance, jumped out at me. So there are two things there, the help of my countenance and my God. And the word countenance, as similar as it is to continent, which is areas of land and on the earth, and incontinence, which is what Goitsch thought that I might be talking about when I said countenance, which is a very different thing, and I'm not talking about incontinence today, is, is this, countenance is a face. Um, and when it says that blessing about God's face shining upon you, it's his countenance that's shining upon you. And we all know what a difference it can make to see someone's face, particularly when someone is talking to you you get a really true or a truer feeling of how something is being said. But even if no words are being used, you can probably guess what's going on, can't you? A prime example would be the look. It might be the one that you use with your children. It might be the one you use with your dog, because I think dogs pick up on it too. Or the people that you work with, people that know you well, your dog, your children, yeah, the people that you work with. And... There are no words needed because the other person knows exactly what you're thinking. 
because it's written all over your face. I had a, I had a not so nice um, situation this week in work well, I, where I was caught with a face. <laughs> but we'll move on from that swiftly. Um, so really, it's a two-part process, as I said, because it, it is with the help, with help of God with stirring our enthusiasm. Um, um, we can ask for that, but it's also about changing our inward thinking, which will probably change our outward appearance. And that seems like a really simple idea, doesn't it? But I think that is as simple as deciding to focus on God and the good things that he's done for you. And that will give you a reason to change your outlook. And then you'll face, find your face changes too. Because if I stand up here grinning like a bull at everybody... My guess is that might, some of you might, I think actually I can see everybody is smiling right back at me. And there's lots of little phrases, isn't there, about smiling and how it takes less muscles to smile. I like that one which says it takes less muscles to smile and then someone else says it takes less muscles to punch you in the face. <laughs> um, and actually, I was thinking about muscle memory and if you are a smiler, then you probably your face is naturally smiley perhaps. And you'll find that it not only affects your own moods when you're smiling, it'll affect and lift the moods of those around you. Uh, in the same way, if you've got somebody who is, uh, looks like they're chewing on a wasp, then you probably get a quick impression of what their general mood is. Right, so, okay, you're ready. This is where I'm going off on one. So you're going to have to pop your trainers on now, and, and you might need your off-roading trainers to keep up with me because I'm going to go around a few corners and uh, bend in my butterfly thinking and down some rabbit holes. So on closer inspection of that last part of the verse, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Because there is a comma there, it is not a new sentence, for I shall, I don't know if it's up there, for I shall yet praise him, comma, who is the health of my countenance and my God. It's not a new sentence, which means it means that God is the help of our countenance. Does that make sense? I shall praise him, praise him the help of my countenance. I shall praise him the help of my countenance. Put that in your head. He is the one who will help us change our outlook. In fact, in the King James Version, it says, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God, which is the one that's up there. Um, and it also, in the King James Version, ties in with verse 5 <coughs> in the same passage where it says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So the psalmist is saying, I shall praise him and look at his face, and by looking at his face, my face will change. When I was writing this down, I was, I was thinking about the fact that perhaps there's some people who are really worried about looking at his face. I, I don't know, it's, it's not my initial thought, but I did think putting myself in some situations perhaps where I've not had a very good week, like when I was caught out with my face that wasn't a very nice face. <laughs> you know then it, would I be worried about looking at his face and knowing what his face might look like when it looked back at me? But no, that isn't the case because God is a loving father and he loves you beyond anything that you can imagine. And yes, we will get things wrong, probably continuously. I know I do. But when you look at him, you will see that he loves you. God, the one who created us and who we have decided to live our lives for, the one who we choose to obey, the one we look to for direction, if we're looking at him and trying to live in the way he wants us to, our countenance should match his, just like if you look at your child with the look like that, they will probably react in that way, won't they? I, the dog even does it. If, if I come in and I think spot something that he's done, he might be sitting there with his tail wagging in his bed, I spot something that he's done and look over at him. He instantly knows, oh, I'm caught out. I've been seen. So 
you know, if we know that we're going to look at God's face and he, that's a loving God looking back at us and wanting to surround us with his love, then that countenance, is his countenance is going to affect our countenance. Does that make sense? Okay, so not too complicated so far. Haven't gone off too far around any particularly bad bends. So the next part of this is taken from a commentary written by Spurgeon. Um, I was looking for information on this idea of countenance and came across this and it hit home as it was something that I've heard a bit about recently and in all honesty I have to say every time I've heard something in this line of thought I've had a bit of a gut reaction of annoyance. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, it's a big admit, admittance from me, okay? So God loves us beyond measure and is able to change any circumstance. We know that. He is able, able to miraculously heal someone. He is the great I am and can do the impossible. But sometimes he doesn't, and I don't know the reason why. And I think that it's probably the question that floors a lot of Christians, especially when you're asked by somebody else, perhaps somebody who's a new Christian, why is this happening? Or somebody who's not a Christian. And to be honest, it's a difficult question to answer, isn't it? Because what you know doesn't, what you know about God makes you unsure of how best to answer it. And sometimes you hear answers that other people have given. And I, I've, well, I've heard things that people have said to other people, and I've just thought, I can't believe they've just said that. That's ridiculous. That's not what God's about at all. Um, hearing that maybe God is allowing things to happen is a very difficult thing to hear in any circumstances. And, and I've had more than one occasion where I felt my hackles rise. So bearing in mind, God wanted to teach me a little and make me come off my I know best soapbox and my internal warrior who's kind of sitting listening to something and thinks, oh, I want to put a, a, a kind of an aside or a caution on that and soften someone else's words. And then I read something that was very interesting. It's not the first part that uh, is, is, is the bit that I find difficult with, but I'll read it from the top because it was really good. This is Spurgeon, and it's talking about, I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Another verse in this psalm so attracts me that though it is not my text, I cannot pass it by without a moment's notice. In the fifth verse, the psalmist says, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And then follows the expression of the text, who is the health of my countenance and my God. So that, that verse five was about praising him for the help of his countenance. And then verse 11 is about our countenance. God's countenance is our help and he himself is the health of our countenance. The best help a man can have in time of trouble is the countenance of God. You know, when God looks on us and loves us. If he feels that he enjoys the divine love and that he is acceptable with the Lord, he becomes at once strong to bear or dare or do, strong to do all those things. Ask the presence of God with thee, child of God, and thou mayest then descend into a lion's den, traverse a fiery furnace or pass through the iron gates of death. A look from the Lord is life and strength to his people. I mean, I know it's written in kind of older language, but we all understand that. We know that if, if we feel God is with us, we can do all of those things. So that, as I said, isn't the bit that I have trouble stomaching. That's why I said this is going weaving a bit. Because I'm nodding my head to all those things. I think that bit's brilliant. Oh, yes, I agree with all of that. Well done, Spurgeon. <laughs> Anyway, um, we know that when we have God by our side, he said he'll never leave or forsake us. And we, we, when we really feel it, when everything just seems to fall into place and everything's going swimmingly and people say to us, oh, this is obviously God's plan. It's a great feeling, isn't it? And it makes us feel like we can go on to the next bit and everything is going brilliantly and we're going to be successful in it all. Yes. Okay, so what about the thing we've prayed about and God has not removed you from the situation? You have not been uh, offered that amazing job that pays five times as much as you earn at the moment and you're only going to have to work half the number of days that you do now. 
In fact, it feels like you're still there and it's just getting harder and there's no end to it. And then someone says, maybe it's God is teaching you something through this. How is your countenance now? How are you feeling now? Is it written on your face? So Spurgeon goes on to say, this help of God's countenance usually comes to believers by their obtaining health for their countenances. It may not please God to lessen the burden, but it comes to the same thing if he strengthens the back. Now think about that. I thought this was brilliant. It may not please God to lessen the burden, but it comes to the same thing if he strengthens the back. He may not recall the soldier from the battle, but if he gives him a greater stomach for the fight and increased strength for its toils, it may be better still for him. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Give a man health in his countenance, and he laughs at that which would have crushed him had he been in another mood. There are times when the grasshopper becomes a burden, and there are other time, other seasons when, with undaunted spirit, we can say, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. Everything depends upon the man's personal condition. So this was a new angle. Not, not a new angle, because I know things are all about perspective, but perhaps it's something I've seen again. And I know that God's answer comes in different ways. And it's obviously not often the way I think it should be. Um, in fact, more often than not, it's, ne- it's never the way that I think God should do something. That's okay. But I like this thought that God might not remove me from the battle, but just give me a stronger stomach to be able to face the battle. Because we know that God will never leave us or forsake us. You know, it says in James 1, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Oh, that's a tough one, isn't it? Particularly when it's quoted to you. And it can leave you feeling a bit like you can't say anything back because you know it's true, but it's not necessarily what you want to hear. But I like the fact that instead of feeling cross now, that that it feels like I'm still stuck in this situation, and even though I'm praying that God will miraculously whisk me away from it, it hasn't happened, that I can now use a different slightly, a, 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 a different prayer. I can ask God to give me the stomach to keep going, and I can ask God to give me his joy and enthusiasm, to be full of God, and remember that theos, enthusiastic, having that passion for God. Um, So this is coming to a very quick end. I'm going to screech the the brakes on now. Um, I'm going to just quickly sum up what I could have said, uh, all those minutes of talking in probably three or four sentences. Okay. God loves you and he will never leave you. No dispute in that. He will give you strength for the things you have to face. And when you look at him, he will give you the enthusiasm to face them. When you look at his face, your face will be changed. And your circumstance may not change, but when you ask him, you will change. That's it. Two big smiles, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, good word, isn't it? Isn't it true? It's a word of truth. Awesome. But you know one thing? I noticed something. You know, they, God looks at us and his countenance that changes us. We have to face him. If you turn your back against him, you will never see his face. That word changes you. Isn't it? So those people, they're watching this, who never face God in your life, or even if you turned your back against them all those times, I encourage you, recommend you, actually I'm telling you, to face God once and for all and see 
His face. The flow of love that will change your lives. And you will see when you face God, do you know whose face you see? You see the face of Jesus who died on the cross, shed his blood, took all the sins that we accumulated and inherited in our lives. And he took that way. And you can give, like Roy said last week, you can give all the bad things, the hurt and sins and all the things to Jesus, but you have to face him to do that. And if you do, as Faith said today, God will change you for better. And you will find a light. So, just say to this, from your heart, Lord, I know I'm a sinful man or woman, sinful person, but I want to change that. I want to give my life including good things and bad things to you and put at your feet because I believe that Jesus, that you have taken them away and will take them away and you will change me because you are my saviour and you you are my Lord and that's all you need to do but let's praise the Lord
Thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord God. God is good.